So um, this is the first of the three talks that, that I'll give. Um, what is the supernatural? What are supernatural beings? If they exist, how can they be contacted? Um, of course, there are many ideas of the supernatural in, in our society. Joan of, Joan of Arc, who was burned at the stake, um, heard voices, believed herself to be in contact with angels at the sanctuary of Lourdes. Uh, Bernadette sees a, an entity that she construes as the Virgin Mary. Uh, the Virgin Mary appears to crowds, uh, to, to, to a group of children at Fatima in, in Portugal, and there are a series of extraordinary apparitions involving tens of thousands of people. Uh, we've all heard of uh, demons and angels. Uh, the West is very interested in the subjects of uh, ghosts. Um, and uh, there are many reports of haunted houses and haunted strange places where spirit entities seem to communicate with us. Um, but this is clearly not the way to explore the supernatural. Um, these guys actually have a ghost meter. <laughs> this, is the, this is the Western technological approach to the supernatural, which believes that everything can be fixed by technology in some way. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, <laughs> we're never going to get to the bottom of the supernatural issue by such, uh, such techniques. Um, spirit possession and spirit mediums are uh, an, an, interesting, an interesting connection between realms. But really, if we want to know about the supernatural, I would say the people we need to be talking to are shamans. They're not possessed. They're not mediums. They don't use machinery. They don't use instruments like ghost meters. But they and their predecessors have uh, developed a psychic technology that enables them to make contact with what they believe are supernatural realms and beings and to renew these contacts proactively whenever they, they wish. This is one of the, I think, the key features of shamanism is that the shaman is uh, to some extent in control of the situation. Uh, the shaman uh, is not a victim of the supernatural. The shaman uh, seeks to master or at least negotiate on equal terms with the supernatural. I think what we have to recognize uh, is that there is um, an extremely ancient phenomenon here with shamanism. It goes back to the roots of uh, human experience um, and that it's probably a mistake, one of the many mistakes our technological society is making to write all that off as primitive superstition or mumbo jumbo. Uh, I think that the shamans have, have a huge amount uh, to teach us and fortunately there still are uh, surviving uh, shamanistic tribal and hunter-gatherer societies uh, where we may go and, and learn from them if we have the humility to, to do so. What's fundamental to uh, shamanism is not a body of law or of doctrine, um, but it's a range of abilities and techniques uh, which are built up through long practical experiences. And, and the common factor in all shamanism, everywhere in the world that it is practiced, is altered states of consciousness. Uh, if somebody claims to be a shaman and they are not entering a deeply altered state of consciousness, then I would say they're using the wrong term for themselves. That person is not a shaman, that person may be something else, but altered states of consciousness are, are fundamental to shamanism. Um, the Inuit uh, shaman, uh, I can't even pronounce his name, Ijugarjuk, uh, endured a, a grueling initiation in isolation during the depths of, of winter, Th 30 days of cold and fasting that he almost died. Um, and, and towards the end of the 30 days, there came to be him a helping spirit in the shape of a woman. And while she came, uh, he, he was asleep and seemed to hover in the air above him. She became his helping spirits. And, and so fasting and uh, austerities and privation were the technique that this individual used to enter a deeply altered state of consciousness. Um, the 
uh, amongst the Shimshian of uh, Canada, North Pacific Coast, very frequently the shamans were individuals who first experienced trance and encountered the spirit world during a, a period of severe illness. Um, and again, arduous initiation rituals, vision quests, drums, rattles, and other techniques were induce, used to induce altered states of consciousness. Um, amongst the Altai of Siberia, the shamanic gift is generally hereditary. Um, the child may be sickly, withdrawn, contemplative, may be subject to epileptic attacks. Uh, the Altaians are convinced that one of his ancestors was a shaman. Uh, and the uh, actual word we use, shaman, in the English language comes from a specific culture in a specific place. Uh, and that uh, is the Tungus Mongol. Um, and their word, saman, actually means one who knows. Uh, and what happened was that as English-speaking uh, ethnographers traveled around the world, uh, they encountered other individuals in other cultures who were playing the same kind of role that these Samans of the Tungus Mongol were playing. And they took that same Tungus Mongol word and they applied it to those other individuals in other cultures as well. So there's a recognition that there's a kind of universal cultural <coughs> phenomenon here. Uh, and it just happens that the, the word for that practitioner in one particular language has now been universalized and is applied to all shamanic practitioners uh, ev every everywhere. Um, it's uh, in interesting, Weston Labare is quoted here about the Tungus. Um, I, I object to the, uh, the word that he uses, narcotic mushrooms, because uh, that's not a correct name for a hallucinogen. But uh, discovery of the future, curing the sick, transporting souls back and forth from the underworld, and managing them there, sacrifice to spirits, including those of animal masters, and initiating new shamans. Some shamans eat narcotic mushrooms, and in their hallucinations visit the world of spirits, where they get answers to the questions posed to them. Well, this is the mushroom that is used uh, amongst the Tungus, and uh, this, of course, is the Amanita muscaria, uh, the fly agaric, um, and uh, it's not an accident that its colors are rather similar to those of Father Christmas. Um, reindeer are involved. Uh, Tungus uh, shamans collect the urine of reindeer that have eaten uh, Amanita muscaria mushrooms, uh, and they drink the urine. Um, uh, quite often, the, the urine of the shaman himself will be drunk by other members of the group. Uh, it seems to be the case that certain impurities in the mushrooms are removed when it's filtered through a human body or an animal's body, uh, and that it's more potently psychoactive in that form than it is when consumed uh, directly. Uh, in fact, it, uh, I've been told that it can be passed through seven human bodies before it loses its, uh, its potency. This may seem a really grotesque idea, um, but uh, it's a technology, and, uh, and, and it works, because it's quite difficult to get off on Amanita muscaria, uh, I would say. They've found a way to do it. So anyway, here's the, the Tungus shaman in flight aboard his supernatural reindeer, uh, and I don't think it's an accident that Father Christmas uh, does a rather similar thing, uh, and indeed, like the Tungus shaman, shaman who enters and leaves through the hole of his hut, that Father Christmas also... Uh, enters and leaves through the chimney hole, uh, leaving, leaving gifts. Um, the uh, use of Amanita muscaria is quite widespread. Uh, the Kanchatkan, northeast Siberia shamaness uh, here shown, um, also practices with uh, Amanita muscaria, and it's used for shamanic purposes amongst a number of Native American groups as well. Uh, and there's a very interesting case that the mysterious substance called soma uh, in the Vedas, uh, was uh, Amanita muscaria. Um, one of the key pieces of evidence for that uh, is that there is a verse in the Vedas which talks about the priests drinking soma and then, excuse the language, pissing soma as well. And uh, when, you know, we drink tea, what we piss is not tea, or beer, what we piss is not beer, but, but in the urine, uh, it's understood that Amanita muscaria, the power of Amanita muscaria remains and is passed on. 
Uh, so there's a, there's a strong case that this is what the original soma uh, of the Vedic texts was. Of course, there's much more evidence than that. Um, peyote is the main active ingredient in uh, mescaline, used by the Wichol and other Native American groups for shamanic healing and, and vision quests. Datura, used by the Zuni and other groups in the American Southwest. Native American sun dance is, an, is a non plant method of inducing altered states of consciousness. The Kalahari Bushmen of Namibia in southern Africa also do not use visionary plants. They will dance for up to 24 hours uh, around a fire uh, until they sense the spirit leaving the body um, and they find themselves in a supernatural realm where they encounter spirit beings and where they often are able to obtain uh, incredibly useful information for the tribe, such as a location of water or the location of game animals that they need to, that they need to hunt. Um, interestingly, the, 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 the Kalahari Bushman shaman in the deeply altered state of consciousness induced by the trance dance um, can take his sweat and touch it to another person and that person will also fall into a, into a trance. It can be passed on by contact uh, at that point. Again, I would say that what we're looking at here uh, is uh, a carefully worked out technology for inducing an altered state of consciousness that is essential to have these experiences, whatever those experiences may be. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting that a lot of the rock art of Southern Africa was created by a now extinct people called the San. There are people who still call themselves the San, but in truth, the original San of Southern Africa who left us the rock art uh, were exterminated by white South Africans, uh, the last of them being, being wiped out in the 1920s or 30s. Uh, at that time, uh, it was possible in South Africa for 50 British pounds uh, to buy a license to hunt the San. Um, it was, uh, they were considered as vermin and uh, you were al allowed to hunt them as you might hunt uh, an elephant or a lion. Uh, and people kept body parts as uh, souvenirs. Uh, but the San have left behind this incredible, incredible legacy of uh, rock art. And uh, interestingly, the body postures depicted in the rock art are still familiar from the surviving Bushmen of the Kalahari in uh, Namibia uh, today. Um, the Mexican shaman uh, Maria Sabina uh, is depicted here uh, with uh, the American ethnobotanist uh, Gordon Wasson. He was actually a, bank a banker, uh <coughs> but he gave all that up for mushrooms. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> He, uh, he's actually, it, I, I believe it's true to say that it's thanks to Gordon Wasson that we in the West now know about the powers of psilocybin mushrooms uh, because uh, their role in Western culture had been stamped out and forgotten. Um, <coughs> and he went down to, he heard of a mushroom, shamanistic use of mushrooms in Mexico in the, in the 1950s. He went down to Mexico, met Maria Sabina, had some extraordinary experiences with her and wrote about it in Life magazine um, about mushrooms that cause strange visions. And uh, it was after that that the explosion of uh, magic mushroom use came about uh, in, in the West. Um, in uh, Central Africa, it's iboga, the plant that enables men to see the dead. Uh, and its use almost certainly originated with pygmy shamans in Central Africa, but it is now uh, used rather widely in Cameroon and uh, Gabon. Uh, and it is the center of a, of a religion there, which is called the Buiti. President of Gabon, uh, Omar Bongo, was uh, a member of the Buiti. Um, it's, a, it, it's an officially recognized uh, religion. And, and here are some of the Buiti uh, ceremonies. I, I have to say from personal experience that iboga is extremely hard work. Um, I, I haven't eaten it in Central Africa, but I had the, I had the um, extract uh, ibogaine uh, in, the, in the UK, and um, it put me through a 48-hour unbelievable physical ordeal. Uh, I felt that I'd just literally been broken to pieces. 
Um, and uh, I, ha I did have some fleeting encounters, including one with the spirit of my recently deceased father, which is one of the reasons that I, I ate the, the plant that enables men to see the dead. But um, I, don't, uh, I don't see myself rushing back to take uh, Iboga again very soon. Um, it's a real mission to, to take it. Um, and then in the Amazon, of course, we have uh, ayahuasca, this, uh, this incredible agent of, of transformation, which is now making its way uh, into Western culture and facing uh, all kinds of obstacles and hurdles from the legal authorities. Um, it's well established, and I, and I myself, in that story that I, I read you, am evidence for this, that, that ayahuasca uh, is incredibly effective in uh, getting people off addictions to drugs. Uh, but despite the fact that that is clear and demonstrated in the evidence, there's huge opposition to it being used for that purpose in the West because it's considered to be just another drug. Well, in the Amazon, it's a medicine uh, and it's used by a very large number of cultures, more than 70 traditional cultures uh, throughout the Amazon basin, and it's known as Yahe and Miho, as well as Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is in fact a Quechua word, which means the vine of the soul, uh, and it's the basis for shamanism throughout much of the Amazon basin. Um, and uh, here's some examples of its preparation and, and ritual amongst the Barsana. Uh, and uh, here uh, it's... Uh, preparation in, in uh, ceremonies in uh, Iquitos in, uh, in Peru, where many Westerners now go to drink ayahuasca uh, legally. And um, really what I'm trying to bring across here is that different traditional shamanic rituals from all parts of the world and all periods of history appear to pursue the same end. Uh, the use of hallucinogens, the monotonous drumming, the repeated refrains, the fatigue, the fasting, the dancing, all of these create a, a sensory condition, an altered state of consciousness that's wide open to the supernatural. And, and I would propose as a hypothesis that the alert problem-solving state of consciousness that we use uh, for our daily lives uh, is a state of consciousness in which it's actually impossible to have supernatural experiences. Um, they, they simply will not happen to us. And that is why uh, Western science, which relies very heavily on the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, is so skeptical uh, about the supernatural. Uh, because Western scientists who embrace the alert problem-solving state of consciousness have never had supernatural experiences. Um, and uh, really down the ages, it's the shamans of, of hunter-gatherer cultures uh, who um, have deliberately altered consciousness, who have the most to teach us uh, about these matters. Just a few of the paintings uh, which Dennis and others have, have also shown of Pablo Amaringo, uh, a, a shaman from, from Peru who worked with ayahuasca and who was also a great artist who, you know, for those who've not drunk ayahuasca and for those who have, um, typifies and, and manifests many of the experiences of ayahuasca, this sense of an encha enchanted, uh, magical world that is out there all around us and yet normally cl closed off to our senses. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's an underworld and uh, serpents are very, very uh, present uh, in it. Um, these incredible saturated colors uh, and the presence as I was discussing in my talk yesterday, and some of what I have to say will overlap with what I said yesterday of these creatures called therianthropes, part human and part animal uh, in form uh, is very, very common in the ayahuasca uh, realm, uh, a kind of enchanted universe filled with sentient, magical life that communicates to you very, very deeply and that, that fills you, as, as Dennis rightly said, with a sense of the fragility um, 
and the wonder, wondrous nature uh, of life on this planet. Um, and there's a, another mystery here, which is the universality of shamanistic experiences that um, anthropologists and ethnologists working with hunter-gatherer cultures have given eerily similar reports by shamans who claim, whilst in trance, to have traveled out of body in spirit realms inhabited by intelligent supernatural entities. Most people in the Western scientific frame just snigger with derision at all of this. Of course there are no spirit realms. Of course there are no supernatural beings. Uh, because we've been reared from birth, we're encouraged every day to despise such ideas. But I think it's worth devoting a little serious attention to these supernatural beings generally nominated by shamans as spirits or spirit animals and sometimes as gods. And uh, these spirits uh, who shamans deal with can take any form they like. They're, they're shapeshifters. But most often they do appear as sentient animals or serpents or birds or, or hybrid creatures like this fellow here. Um, very commonly as uh, therianthropes, sometimes fully human. Um, and uh, shamans uh, frequently claim to have been abducted by spirits to strange locations that are sometimes in caves deep underground or sometimes underwater. You can see here in Pablo's paintings that these two therianthropes, these mermaids, are drawing the shaman down beneath the waters of the Amazon to a mystical place that they call Encante, the enchanted city, uh, which um, you will never find by diving in the Amazon, uh, but that you can find uh, if you alter your consciousness through the drinking of the ayahuasca brew. Um, and uh, the Australian ab Aboriginal sh shamans, the clever men or men of high degree, described celestial ascents to meet the sky gods, such as Bayame, Biral, Goim, and, and Jill. Um, Bushman shamans of the Kalahari Desert of Botswana speak of meeting spirits after climbing ropes or threads of light uh, to metal objects in the sky. One refers to a well of metal that he climbs up to uh, on these threads of light. And the ancient rock paintings of the Sam uh, illustrate these ideas, this climbing of threads of light and climbing up to some object in the sky amongst the stars here. Uh, another uh, universal experience is the shamanic uh, ordeal. Um, amongst the Aborigines, uh, the candidate shaman in, in, in is placed in the mouth of a cave. He's approached by Iruntarinia spirits who, who pierces him through the neck with a lance and cuts off his head. Uh, a Kyrgyz shaman reports he has five spirits in heaven who cut me with 40 knives and prick me with 40 nails. Kalahari Bushmen say the same thing. Spirits pierce them with spears and arrows. Um, shamans all over the world talk about being cut open by spirits so that rock crystals or sacred stones and magical ob objects can be implanted in their bodies. Um, and interestingly, Mar Maria Sabina, uh, she says, I take the little one that springs up out of the earth and I see God. Um, she, uh, during one of her psilocybin trances, encountered a spirit who thrust a book into her hands and instructed it to use her to do her work better and help people who need help and know the secrets of the world where everything uh, is known. Uh, and Maria, although illiterate, told Gordon Wasson, suddenly I realized I was reading and understood all that was written in the book and that I became as though richer, wiser, and in that one moment I learned millions of things. I learned and learned. And Maria was not allowed to keep the book, which, uh, which remains in the sky. There's many discussions of uh, shamans having relationships in the spirit world, a, a wife or a husband in the spirit world, children in the spirit world who are part spirit, part human. Um, amongst the witch all, uh, we have these uh, peyote visions, uh, in including these colored energy disks uh, the receiving of dreams, healing energy from the sun, rain-making powers. Spirits of deer offered knowledge for using powers with wisdom and precaution. Eagle offered power to see all. Um, Ulu's allies and make him strong against harm doers. These are universal shamanistic experiences. And uh, oddly, 
uh, as I touched on yesterday and will elaborate on today, many uh, of these experiences that shamans report with spirits are astonishingly similar to the encounters with aliens that are reported by tens of thousands of people in the West uh, who believe they've been abducted by UFOs. Um, and we have um, the testimony of a number of researchers into the UFO abduction experience to provide a vast dossier of evidence on this, of whom the most important, I believe, by far uh, is the late Dr. John Mack, who um, I was privileged to know and who was formerly professor of psychiatry at Harvard University until he was killed by in a car accident in London in 2004. Now, John Mack uh, started to receive troubled individuals in his practice who reported extraordinary experiences of having been, which they construed as having been abducted by aliens. And unlike most psychiatrists who immediately concluded that such people were insane, uh, John Mack decided to take his patients seriously and to listen to what they had to say. For that, Harvard University tried to fire him. Uh, he had tenure, uh, and he was a respected practitioner in his field and a teacher, but Harvard University decided they were going to get rid of him because he wasn't towing the party line. Uh, and he had to fight uh, a, a tremendous battle in the courts uh, with a great lawyer named Danny Sheehan at his side to keep uh, his job at Harvard, which he did in the end succeed in doing. This shows us how our society seeks to control reality. Uh, and, how, and how those who go against the established paradigm, even though they may be doing so for very good reasons, are actually in danger of losing their livelihood as a result of doing so. How can we claim to live in a society that has free speech or freedom of thought when such, such things can occur? So John did keep his job, but he told me that ever afterwards his colleagues would pass him in the halls of Har Harvard and not recognize him as though he were, or as though he had become uh, invisible, and he told me that he had been banished to the ontological and epistemological wilderness from which he was not allowed to return. Uh, but he did leave us many books, uh, and those books document the accounts of those who believe they've been abducted by UFO abductees, and not to forget David Jacobs and Bud Hopkins either, who've also added to that dossier. Um, and, you know, some of the, uh, some of the examples uh, Spirits encounter, uh, encountered by shamans most often appear in the form of, form of animals and birds and fish, and, and this is true of UFO abductees as well. Uh, and John sums it up that the aliens appear to be consummate sh shifters, often appearing initially to the abductees as animals, owls, eagles, raccoons, and deer are among the creatures the abductees have seen uh, initially. Uh, this is, uh, which is, or, or being drawn up into the sky that is reported by shamans is also reported again and again by UFO abductees. These apparently completely separate domains of experience prove to have many crossovers at the phenomenological level. Um, this sense of being abducted underwater or underground or into caves that is very common amongst shamans is also very common uh, amongst UFO abductees. And uh, the shamanic ordeal, those bizarre surgical procedures at the hands of spirits, that too is something that UFO abductees repeatedly report. Uh, and again, you can see that there are astonishing similarities between the domain of shamans and spirits and the domain of UFO abductees. Um, sex with spirits, offspring in the spirit world, the parallel amongst UFO abductees is sex with aliens and, and hybrid offspring uh, in the alien realm. Uh, being given a book by a spirit, UFO abductees have been given books as well. And just as Maria Sabina was not allowed to bring her book back, so UFO abductees have not been allowed to bring their book back. And uh, fairies and elves, this is another curious phenomenon of human experience. Oddly enough, just at the time that it became completely unacceptable to talk about, you know, there's a joke, they used to say, he's away with the fairies, you know. <coughs> just at the time that it became ab absurd to consider fairies in the West, around about the 1940s or 50s, that was the time that we started having encounters with aliens. Um, they became the, 
the new um, fairies, uh, if you like, or perhaps the very old fairies, uh, because there are again are astonishing similarities between these uh, between these domains. Fairies, just like spirits, just like aliens, were in the business of abducting people and taking them off into another world. Fairies could be kind, could give gifts, had healing powers. They had the power of flight, they used celestial vehicles, they abducted people underground into the hollow hills. And as I pointed out yesterday, mushrooms feature in both of these uh, medieval woodcuts. Uh, fairies also appear as therianthropes, part animal, part human in form, uh, like Melusine, who is part serpent, part human, and who abducts human babies. Um, and uh, frequently women are abducted to nurse fairy babes and found themselves in an anonymous room with no apparent exit. Um, and when the child is weaned, the nurse dies or is conveyed back or gets her choice to stay there. So my suggestion is that, that actually these three supposedly different domains, fairies and elves, aliens, uh, spirits, they're all one thing. They're all one phenomenon that it has endured uh, for a very long time in human culture, uh, and that simply it's construed in different ways by different cultures at different times. It's not at all surprising that we in the West today, who are exploring outer space, are construing these encounters as encounters with aliens from other planets. And we think that they're you know, something like us, but they just have higher tech than we do and they're crossing interstellar space. That's a perfectly natural construal for us to make of this mysterious experience. Uh, but I would say that we should pause and question that uh, very, very carefully. I think, I think the appropriate reaction to the UFO abduction, the, the ET abduction and the UFO uh, phenomenon um, is one of mystery and awe. I think we do have a great mystery here in our culture. Uh, but I think we're rushing too rapidly to the conclusion about what is at the source of that mystery. And that if we're going to consider it uh, properly, uh, we need to take account of all these other older experiences uh, in, in human culture.